if you're a frequent viewer of the Spectre Creative channel, you know that we spend a lot of time talking about Masters of the Universe. Well, part of the reason is because I spent a good 10 years of my life brand managing this, and I'm a lifelong collector of Masters of the Universe. Now, when the toy came out in 1982, it definitely changed the way boys' action figures were created, were marketed, and, well, dominated the action figure market. In fact, Mattel took out print ads literally showing He-Man dominating the competition where competitive Kenner products were actually featured in the background of the ad. Yeah, good luck seeing something like that today. Well, while He-Man was known as a character with a huge entourage of villains and heroes and allies, as well as a centerpiece being Castle Grayskull, which if you didn't have Castle Grayskull, you really weren't playing Masters of the Universe. Well, okay, I mean, obviously you were, but, you know, the castle was the centerpiece. And the brand really took off. In fact, it not only dominated the toy aisles in the early 80s, but it extended to books, to audio tapes, and famously the Filmation Animated series, which ran 130-plus episodes. And eventually, He-Man did become a worldwide icon of strength, capturing the hearts and minds of an entire generation of kids. And that generation grew up to be adult toy collectors who invested heavily in updated versions of the characters aimed at more of a collector of toys versus a player of toys. And He-Man continues to be reinvented. In fact, there's two new shows in 2021 on Netflix and multiple toy lines in stores today in 2021. And back in the early 80s when He-Man was at the peak of his popularity and sales, he was dominating sales so much that he outsold Barbie and Hot Wheels, which shocked a lot of people internally at Mattel, which very much saw Hot Wheels and Barbie being the core of the company. Now, the whole rise and fall of He-Man as the best-selling toy line of the mid-80s is a story best told in other ways. Roger Sweet's book is a great place to start. And while the financial and cultural success of He-Man was great, so was kind of his whiteness. At least, that was definitely how he was viewed by a lot of non-white kids, parents, and, well, toy buyers. Sure, you had characters like Clamp Champ, who were introduced later in the line, and other characters got what would be called a racial swap, or a race swap, in both 2001 and in 2021, but He-Man was really seen as the epitome of a white powerful character, and for children who weren't Caucasian, this was an issue. Well, enter Yila Eason. That's Y-L-A, Yila Eason. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Well, she saw He-Man and got it for her son. Her son enjoyed it. But while on vacation with her son and her husband in Jamaica, she and her husband, Milton, saw that their son was having problems associating himself with He-Man. He liked the character, he liked how easy it was to grip in his hand, the fact that it was a character made of muscles, but he couldn't see himself as He-Man because he was black and He-Man was white. How is he going to possibly grow up to be He-Man if he didn't have the same skin color? Well, Ela Easton said, this is something that we need to address. There are not enough strong African-American toys out there at market for young children to play with and see as aspirational. If you wanted to become He-Man, you literally had to put on a white He-Man mask, which today might even be thought of as cultural appropriation. Gosh, I hope I'm not butchering this and using things inappropriately. Obviously, there were aspirational black heroes and black characters in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but they weren't really toys. And even a character like Black Panther is huge today, and you can find Black Panther toys everywhere. Back in the 80s, he was basically uh, stuck in comic books. You didn't really see merchandise of him until the movie. Well, that is why Ela invented Sun Man, a brand new character that she could give to her son, who could see himself as an empowered black hero, a character that was just as muscular as He-Man, but was not as aggressive. The, his sword and vest harnessed the power of the sun, and he didn't fight evil as much turned evil into illusion and would travel out of his body to do this. Hey, it was an awesome way to combat evil and less aggressive. 
His main enemy, well, really his only enemy, was Pigman, also a character very reminiscent of Masters of the Universe as far as body build, and with two characters and $180,000 invested from multiple, multiple investors, they took their idea to Asia, had prototypes made up, and brought their figure to market. They were very clear that this character was not just He-Man colored black, but was an African-American character, noting the facial sculpt, the hair, and it was meant to absolutely be a avatar for the imagination for young black children. Now, you obviously can't look at him without saying, oh, well, it definitely looks like it fits in with the Masters of the Universe world. You know, couldn't Mattel just shut this down? They're clearly, quote-unquote, ripping He-Man off. Well, this was already addressed when Remco came out with their Warlord line a few years earlier, and judges found over and over again that one couldn't copyright a muscular body. So, with that precedent set, Sun Man, the greatest superhero of them all, was ready to take the world by storm. And take the world by storm he did. Well, actually, yes, he, he sold $120,000 worth of product in 1986 dollars, and they only had two characters. He was even marketed directly on packages as more powerful than He-Man. So there was definitely a uh, stake right in the ground of what kind of market they were going after. It, new characters were introduced in the second year, with sales generating between $800,000 and $1 million. And again, this was in 1986 dollars, so quite successful. In fact, the property spawned merchandise, it had t-shirts, it had a book explaining the peaceful origin of Sun Man. And the character selection included lots of different races and ethnicities. While they were all male, there was an African American, there was an Asian character, and there was even a Caucasian character. So they would gang together with Boltman and Space Sumo to battle against Pigman and make sure the illusion of evil was wiped out. Different packaging variants were introduced and did make it to market because while retailers were shy at first, the sales couldn't be argued. And with the success of Sun Man, Kayla decided to form Olmec Toys, which would focus on other categories, but always with a black by design, her, uh, her logo, if you will, influence, making sure that there were toys that were aimed at young African-American kids, both boys and girls, so they could see themselves as their toys and use them rightfully so as avatars for the imagination. Children naturally gravitate to toys that remind them of themselves. Boys gravitate to boy toys. Girls gravitate to girl toys or female toys. Obviously, boys and girls can be into any toy they want, but it's great to have product out there designed for different ethnicities. And in this case, Omac Toys was specifically focused on creating product for young African-American children. Dolls, even historical characters in the Our Powerful Past line, which actually only included one character, Malcolm X. And of course, their other entry into the boys' action adventure aisle was the Bronze Bombers. Much like Sun Man went right up against He-Man, the Bronze Bombers were designed to be very reminiscent of another hit toy line from the 1980s. If you couldn't guess it by now, it was G.I. Joe. These military characters of an almost entire African-American squad, with I guess you could say token female Caucasian character, were even packaged very similar to G.I. Joe with the bright red-yellow flame that was reminiscent of G.I. Joe branding at the time. And yeah, something like this probably wouldn't fly today with the way trademarks and copyrights are, but it was great, and her work has been celebrated for decades. She's now teaching at Rutgers University, which is actually where my wife did her undergraduate work, and she's often brought out and honored in different, uh, you know, the, the black community during different celebrations and as a look as not just a uh, black entrepreneur, but a female black entrepreneur. Sun Man himself has also lived on both in fan art and internet short stories. He's had a fan following of his own, and while it's definitely smaller than Masters of the Universe, the link between the brands is pretty obvious, even to the point that fan customs have been created of Sun Man using Masters of the Universe classic parts, as if Sun Man was part of that line. Which, speaking of that, there are some rumors out there that Sun Man may be showing up in the Motu Origins line. 
I have no idea about this. I can't imagine legally Mattel can make Sun Man unless they bought him. And I don't know if Olmec Toys is interested in selling their number one male action figure creation. But who knows? Maybe the chance to get him into Origins would mean wider distribution and a bigger audience. So, hey, the more kids that have toys that they can look up to, the better. And Yala was a great pioneer and is absolutely viewed in the toy industry as a forward-thinking, creative pioneer who helped give young black boys a character they could look up to. If you like this video and want to see more, please do subscribe, ring the bell, leave a comment. It all helps the algorithm. And let me know comments below your thoughts. Did you have a Sun Man growing up? Kind of wish I did. He's absolutely awesome.